This is a discussion of the Great Artesian Basin, um, recording this at the beginning of August 22. Here in green is uh, the general concept of the uh, Great Australian Basin. Throughout the history of sedimentation, Australia and Antarctica was still attached as a portion of Gondwana, but the sea invaded the continent uh, four or five times, a bit more than 100 million years ago, when dinosaurs roamed the land, and Australia enjoyed uh, tropical growth conditions. Surprising, however, that uh, we were within uh, 30 degrees of the South Pole, or even uh, we were likely uh, latitudes of the order of 50 to 70 degrees south latitude. Later uplift along the East Australian coastline created the artesian effects of the Great Australian Basin. The popular concept is that this is a simple geological basin, but this is actually not so. It's a very complex system. However, the overall principle is with um, elevated intake areas in the east or the recharge areas shown where rain is falling, sands which conduct the water westward, getting to depth and becoming uh, artesian from their uh, confinement by impervious layers shown there in colour. And uh, ultimately, uh, they may come out as springs if that still is below the level of the intake areas. Of course, you um, can get those throughout the basin. Some bores may prove to be uh, sub-artesian, that is, the water doesn't rise to uh, run naturally from the surface. That's because of their level relative to intake areas. The various aquifers may uh, have fractures which allow them to seep one into another, and they can also get water from underlying basins, which is a complex picture. Here it's stated that sedimentation started in the Mesozoic Triassic effectively about 250 million years ago and had some five invasions by the sea in uh, that region around 100 million years ago or 130 million years ago. So here's a, a further illustration of the intake beds uh, where some particular shallow bores may not actually be artesian, whereas others could, in fact, be a deeper bore with good artesian character. Now, the principle of the Great Artesian Basin, then, artesian and sub-artesian bores, as shown here, really relies on the potentiometer surface, which is the height across the basin where water will rise from the particular aquifer. Here again is the uh, maximum extent of sediments, essentially in the Mesozoic era, that's 250 to 65 million years ago. There are sub-basins like the Carpentaria Basin in the north, from which direction the sea incursions occurred, or the Sirad Basin in the east, which is separated by a ridge. Here we show the intake areas and in blue, the region of natural springs, some of which over the years have ceased flowing. The little arrows show the direction of flow of groundwaters and uh, dotted line, the structural ridge that separates the Surat Basin from the Eremanga Basin. It's rainfall in the intake areas, which uh, of course can differ for different uh, stratigraphic units within the basin. And uh, only about 1% actually add, ends up in the artesian stories. And in the west in particular, on the western margin of South Australia, you can get enormous mound springs built up due to peat and salt deposits. And they're effectively fossil springs, that, but they appear as uh, mazes in some regions, uh, which, uh, which there's no evident water. Um, and this statement is that water flows at a slow rate, or only a matter of uh, 0.2 of a metre to two and a half metres a year, so that some of the oldest water is several million years old. And temperatures can vary from warm, uh, 30 degrees, to even boiling temperatures locally. 
And so there are several aquifers with uh, different potentiometer levels. And uh, the Kadnaui and Hutton sandstones are the most important. We'll see those in sections later. Uh, and only 10% of the basin area at most are intake beds. And uh, that percolation rate there is indicating uh, up to five metres per year locally. At one time, there was something in the order of 600 artesian springs. And by 1900, there were uh, 500 bores providing uh, water for cattle stations across the inland. Many of the younger aquifers are non-artesian and very easily depleted. And all the New South Wales natural springs are now dry and most of Queensland also. Part of the concern was that by 1915, there were over 1,500 flowing artesian bores and of course, enormous loss of water by evaporation. And there were literally thousands of kilometers of inefficient open bore drains. They were left pouring into the open ponds. Turn of the 21st century, there were um, something 10,000 kilometers of drains decommissioned. That involved capping something in the order of 900 bores or rehabilitating their casing, etc. Even 10 years later, there was something in the order of 1,800, 1,900 uncontrolled bores an enormous wastage of water. This is another diagram showing the um, intake areas in brown with the uh, flow directions and the spring areas outlined by dots. Shallow waters were available uh, in many areas of the um, channel country. Uh, Porcupine Gorge, north of Huendon, uh, has some of the older river plain sandstones, something in the order of 130 million year old, and they underlie a basalt cover on the road up to the Lind, to the north of Huendon. Around Huendon, uh, marine rocks also occur, so it's possible to find uh, ichthyosaurs or marine uh, reptiles, as well as uh, land-based or land-dwelling dinosaurs in other areas. Regions of central Queens and highlands, the precipice sandstone is one of the main intake units and forms very prominent uh, ridges along the Great Dividing Range in that uh, southern central region of Queensland. This is a three-dimensional illustration through the Great Australian Basin, showing the aquifer layers and uh, the underlying geological basins. So effectively, the Eremanga Basin, shown here as the upper um, area of substance and sedimentation, is the Great Australian Basin, whereas the uh, others mentioned from left to right, the Paderka, Simpson, Cooper, Warabin um, and Ada Vale, and uh, Galilee Basin, and uh, in the Far East, the Bowen Basins, important for the coal of Permian Age, are all underlying basins, but part of this complex, in a way, of the uh, Great Australian Basin, or its super basin, I suppose. The result from subsidence that is influenced by the long term subduction that occurred of the Pacific. Ocean plates beneath the uh, Australian or Eastern Gondwanan mainland. So the uh, Cooper and Paderka basins in South Australia produced gas for half a century and uh, migrating oil with water from these older basins has ponded in uh, some of the Eremanga basin traps and that has proved very valuable for uh, oil in more recent years. The generalised picture showing here, right hand side, uh, essentially subduction had ceased by 200 million years ago. Um, and uh, you had some sinking of this heavy slab, which probably caused uh, stretching in the hinterland and subsidence of the uh, 
various basins and uh, that's the overall mechanism for some of those basins, Derrica Bowen, etc. And uh, also for the Garamanga Basin. Uh, the basement blocks to those basins were the Mount Isa, Mesoproterozoic, very old rocks, and the um, Thompson origin of about 500 million years, which underlies much of the Queensland area. In the east of Australia, of course, there was a younger origin, the New England origin, which only ceased uh, at the close of the Paleozoic about 250 million years ago. Um, the New England mountain building event of 200 million years ago was due to plate collision and westward subduction of the Pacific plate. And it built up the highlands of the eastern margins of Australia. Um, rollback of that subduction, that's um, eastward movement of the subduction and subduction um, ceased um, and it resulted in this inland extension. That gave rise to inland seas, swamps, deserts, uh, and as the sea level rose, uh, you had incursions of uh, marine um, conditions, and that occurred four or five times, um, particularly in the interval of 130 to 100 million years. And the result is this basin of thick sediments, the Great Australian Basin, particularly known as the uh, Aramanga Basin that hosts our inland water, oil, and uh, some gas. So here again is the situation. Uh, an early Cretaceous volcanic rift developed uh, in the Whitsunday province. So there's the youngest volcanic and uh, intrusive rocks in Australia. And this is related in a way to the separation of the uh, Lord Howe Rise probably didn't occur till um, 80 or 100 million years ago. However, also at about 180 million years, perhaps through to 160, you had uh, a volcanic province underlying the uh, Great Australian Basin. This has only recently been discovered in uh, drilling, and uh, it accounts for some of the volcanic material that is found in the basin although much of it appears to have been derived along with the other sediments from the volcanic arc in the east and uh, the uplifted region resulting from the uh, New England orogenesis or mountain building phase. This is a three-dimensional diagram of much of that. You can see the subduction going on in the uh, far right of the picture here with a grey-coloured oceanic crust subducting beneath the New England region and that eventually drew back to the east to a th for a thousand kilometers or so and uh, it left volcanic arc continuing through into the Cretaceous but uh, you can see how the spread of sediments uh, occurred with this broken, broken head formation in pinks and uh, uh, I've inserted there uh, a red intrusive body which has to be imagined to be subsurface. That would be the Warney Volcanics, and that's surrounded by relatively low energy um, fluvial deposits, etc., or occasionally um, aeolian uh, sediments, particularly in South Australia, bordering a um, southern rift, or the rift that uh, came through into Lake Eyre region. So we note there the Jurassic, uh, about 200 million years ago, there was subduction in the east or just ceasing. And uh, its volcanic chain in coastal Queensland shed the detritus into the Surat Basin. Uh, however, newly discovered Warney volcanics provide uh, an additional central source for air. Yet another uh, cutaway, this is an oblique section through Queensland. Um, one from the top left running across to the centre right comes from the Gulf of Carpentaria uh, across the coastal southern central Queensland and Great Basin uh, volcanic contribution to the sediments. Looking again at the Eremanga Basin, its division in the Surat Basin in the southeast and the Carpentaria Basin in the north. 
with the offshore basins shown in a lighter green. And uh, that's all regarded as the broader Great Australian Super Basin, the Aramanga Basin and the Surad Basin and the uh, southern Queensland regions. Just another section reminding us of the character of the uh, Aramanga Basin. This is not showing basins below it, of course. And two of the main units, which are aquifers, are the Kadnawi and Hutton sandstones. There are aquifers also in the uh, topmost unit, the Winton. First marine incursion occurs where that blue of the Kadnawi formation is. It's got an ellipse around it. While shallow seas existed in the uh, Shirad Basin there, you had uh, extraterrestrial impact structures, either comets or large fragments, very large fragments of meteorite from extraterrestrial source ploughed into the shallow seas and have left huge craters. And those uh, occur at that level of the um, lower part of the Kadnawi formation. And here's one of them, the Tukanuka uh, structure, which, uh, as you can see, is uh, 50 to 60 kilometres across in the central uplift area and goes out uh, as a circular trough or crater of the order of 100 kilometres. This uh, central uplift brings Ordovician rocks in a central core, much like uh, when you drop a pebble into mud, you get a bloop coming up of material from deeper down in the mud. This occurs, as you can see, uh, only uh, something in the order of uh, 70 or 80 kilometres southwest of Aramanga in Queensland. There is yet another one, the uh, Talandilly structure near Blackall. Uh, it's less well defined by drilling, but clearly is a similar impact that occurred at the same time in the uh, lower part of the Kadnawi formation. These are really interesting structures, quite large scale. So this one's about 90 kilometres across. It was discovered during petroleum exploration in the 1980s. It's inferred to be the same as the uh, Tukanuka crater forming impact. Both of them deeply covered by uh, the Saramanga Basin. You can see from where these arrows go that uh, you're in the uh, marine portion of the Kadnawi Formation. And again, shows the basins underlying the Great Australian Basin. Some of these, where contact is suitable, leak groundwater into the Aramanga Basin. And of course, that's where uh, gas and particularly oil is presumed to have percolated from those underlying basins into traps in the Aramanga. And this is perhaps that situation along a basement high, the Mercury Ridge. There's also the um, Cambrian Age Warburton Basin deposits uplifted in that high uh, by faulting and uh, the groundwaters have seeped up and uh, carried petroleum products, notably oil, to be entrapped in small dome and fault controlled basins in the overlying uh, Kadnawi Formation and uh, the Birkenhead Formation as well. It shows the uh, location where Warning Box Canics have drilled basin in the south and uh, it gives a three-dimensional view of several of the aquifers in, say, the upper one in the Winton um, Macunda unit and uh, lower down the Kadnawi uh, uh, Hurrah aquifer, and the bottom one, the Hutton sandstone. It's also notable here that the precipice sandstone, if you look at about two, three o'clock just to the uh, uh, right of the red volcanic blob, the precipice sandstone is relatively unimportant, pinches out just beyond the uh, Surat Basin, not notably developed within the main region of the uh, Aramanga Basin, yet it's such a prominent unit in outcrop as the uh, exposure of the basal units of the uh, Aramanga Basin is regarded as a very significant intake bed uh, although it doesn't uh, extend right across the Aramanga Basin. Here then is yet another cross-section west to east, and it shows the um, 
material that covers much of the Eramanga, certainly in South Australia and the very southwest portion of Queensland, the Lake Eyre Basin. Uh, these are non-marine sediments and uh, uh, windblown sands, etc. cetera. Uh, and these blanket out a lot of the Winton, which is particularly strongly weathered through that region. It's really only where do you get over into the uh, higher regions closer to the uh, Great Dividing Range that the Winton formation is um, fresh and uh, unweathered. Uh, we'll see something of that in, in a few minutes' time. A complex situation for the various aquifers in the basin. Just reading that, uh, it's a conceptual cross-section there in Manga Basin, showing the main sandstone aquifers in blue and aquitards in grey. They're the impervious layers that confine the aquifers, allowing them to be artesian or sub-artesian. Otherwise, they wouldn't be retained as a, a system allowing artesian rise of the water. Uh, it shows the relationship between the shallower winds and formation, which has some coals, and uh, also uh, the level of the marine incursions in the Kadnawi formation, which has four or five transgressions of high sea level across the basin. The wind and Helso has one or the last uh, marine incursion. The Hutton sandstone, which has some oil and anticline derived from the underlying basins, is far more extensive in the basin than the precipice sandstone, usually thought of as an important intake bed in the east. So just looking at the first inland sea, about 135 million years ago in Kadnawi time, there were four more invasions uh, in high sea level times over the next 35 million years. Um, and marine conditions uh, deposited uh, the uppermost Kadnawi formation sands. Um, marine fossils, um, but of course only occasional bloat and float land dinosaurs, but you do get marine ichthyosaurs, etc. cetera. Uh, these of course are thought to have been incursions of uh, uh, marine conditions from the north, the last one in the Winton formation. So you can see there, uh, in general terms, the fringes of the uh, Great Australian Basin and particularly the Aramanga Basin with swamp and shoreline deposits, particularly Winton formation, are in the central portion of the basin. And uh, marine sediments from the Aramanga Seas outcrop beyond these peripherally, occasional outcrops of basement rocks, particularly, of course, in the east, you get the uh, Bowen and Galilee basins still acting as aquifers beneath it or beneath the Surat Basin in particular. In the south, you do get to basement rocks, of course, particularly getting down into South Australia around the um, Flinders Ranges region. And it's notable here, we discussed another time, that there's clear evidence of um, glacial conditions uh, during portion of the sequence of the Iramanga Basin. So it's uh, quite surprising that the uh, Flinders Ranges in the north were glaciated at that time and uh, floating ice, pack ice apparently carried boulders across a lot, a lot of South Australia area around Cooper Pee in the far west of the Aramanga Basin. These have been known for many, many years, but the evidence of the glaciations only more recently been uh, worked up by the South Australian Geological Survey, Stephen Hoare. Some of the marine fossils, particularly in this case from the third inland sea, an ammonite. I'll just treat these very briefly. And some of the later ammonites show uncoiling, possibly degenerate. There's a huge array of ammonites, which are, of course, very significant marker fossil throughout the rest of the uh, globe. And so also are belemnites, which were supporting structures for a squid like mollusk. And these are extremely abundant, particularly in uh, Tulabuck formation and some of the other units. In the marine beds, uh, we expect uh, plesiosaurs and some fine remains being discovered, even some uh, 
partly opalized, better occurrences possibly in uh, Queensland than in South Australia. Pliosaur, Coronosaurus, I don't think that's uh, dinosaurian in character, but it was the apex predator of the Aramanga Basin, apparently, about 100 million years ago. We see a conceptual death there of a sauropod dinosaur in the Winton Coal Measures, collapsed and uh, predators have been added as it lies in the swamps. And the footprints of that character are those that we see preserved about uh, around Roma. This particular section, a cross section in the uh, region around Mooney and Toowoomba shows the uh, open cast coal measure situations within the uh, uh, Iramanga Basin and uh, uh, coal gas in slightly deeper areas where open cast uh, coal is not practical. And this is causing a great deal of contention around Dolby. And you can see how these relate to the deeper Hutton sandstone aquifers, etc. Subsequent to the uh, marine incursions of 100 million years ago, uh, you had weathering widespread and some humid periods, and particularly about 60 million years ago, you had extensive leaching due to a pluvial climate where our iron, aluminium and uh, silica separate out to form hard pan regions um, with different layers of concentration of the iron above and a mottled clay below and a, a bleached kaolinitic clay underneath that. And sometimes a uh, silica-rich band, which is a grey billy, or um, silcrete forms particularly in the uh, uh, lower parts of the profile. All other elements tend to get leached from the uh, lower sections of the weathering. Um, that can extend down all oh, 50 metres or more. And when streams erode these, the more resistant uh, iron and aluminium rich or silica rich layers tend to form mesas the mottle layers may be even undercut as it's a softer clay layer. And same with the bleached layers form the lower part of the uh, landscape. So this is very characteristic of the um, channel country leading into the uh, sands of the west. Here's this typical profile with a hard silica and iron rich capping over the bleached uh, clay rich layers. And uh, this is an er eroded of an original high level, 60 million year old peneplain land surface. So almost all the topography would have uh, disappeared from the region. There must have been renewed uplift in a period of 10, 15 million years ago at the time of the elevation of the Great Dividing Range, which has allowed the uh, erosion and uh, uh, remnant mesas. Is situation uh, with that hard cap of the old land surface developed on uh, marine rocks, I think in this case of the Winton, but they're visible in the uh, bottom of the picture there, stratiform Cretaceous rocks. They're extensively weathered in the upper section with the uh, iron rich residual forming a hill capping. There's another more familiar scene with the uh, very extensive kangaroo or Mitchell grass downs in the distance and uh, modern erosion surface with remnants of the older surfaces surviving as mazes and uh, buttes. Part of this process of uh, silica uh, enrichment in the iron rich capping is the formation of a boulder opal. And here's a typical example of that very weathered rock fractured and invaded by uh, opaline silica, which has uh, been a valuable uh, source of opal with a very good play of colours. In fact, uh, quite a wide distribution of the Australian opal fields running from Minterby and Coobapedi and Amuka in South Australia through White Cliffs in New South Wales, Lightning Ridge, and up through Quilpie uh, and Opalton in central Queensland, 
one of the few places in the world where opaline silica is found. Uh, again, just detailing the Queensland deposits, the dark green color is where the wind formation is deeply weathered. Opal is not found in the lighter green areas, which is the unweathered winton. You may still, however, find uh, dinosaur remains and tracks in those regions, such as around Longreach, well, even Blackall in an embayment of the uh, Surat, extending down south westward of uh, Longreach. It's probably uh, long enough interval for today. We will leave the recording at this point. Thank you.